Hey, Virginia is sponsored in part by... Everance Financial is grateful to serve this community. As a faith-rooted financial services organization, we're dedicated to helping members grow more confident futures with their values in mind. A community that's doing better together. Hey, Virginia, what's going on? I'm Kate Martin, your host, and in this episode, we'll meet an amazing Charlottesville artist, explore caverns deep below the surface, and we'll even get an inside look at the world of roller derby. We'll also visit Natural Bridge and explore the Monacan Indian history that surrounds it. Plus, we'll talk with a local author and get his take on tree conservation. And of course, the Virginia Sound Showcase doesn't disappoint, as Gypsy Town shares their unique sound. All this and more on this episode of Hey Virginia! Hey Virginia had the pleasure of meeting one of Charlottesville's artists and illustrators. He's made his living as a medical illustrator and now continues his artistic journey through collecting and modifying war action figures and creating fine art with his signature technique that makes colored pencil impressions look like watercolor paintings. Please join us as we explore the world of Frank Walker. <laughs> Since childhood, uh, we used to read comic books, and we used to emulate comic books, my brother and myself. And we would draw from comic books and just started drawing everything that was visible. And uh, the, the kicker was, I, I guess the most influential thing was that we had, this is Francis Brand, the purple lady, gave us a show, a backyard art show. Took some clothespins and strung some paintings on a, a, a clothesline and we sold a couple. I think all, between all four of us, we may have made $25. And we said, man, this is what we want to do. So my brother became an artist, as did I. The Charlottesville grows. I think so does the art community or the creative community grows here. Most things here in Charlottesville were traditional, like the, for instance, like the Lee statue. You know, those kind of traditional things. Now those things are, are, are turning about like they have the photographic show on the mall. They're, they're probably, since I was a kid, there's probably uh, 20 galleries as opposed to there was only one. When I joined uh, the military, uh, it was a uh, volunteer. I, had, uh, I hadn't gotten drafted, wanted to do something. Uh, needed a job, and the military was a uh, uh, perfect place for me. My first choice was to go to Vietnam, but they weren't sending anyone else to Vietnam. They sent us all to Germany. And so that is what the military taught me. You, you do whatever you do, do it well, and, and do it to the end of the day. I'd do shows at military shows, and I would do talks. Uh, usually when I did a show, I'd have the African-American soldiers out because I'd see kid, African-American kids come by and they had no idea that their parents or their uncles had served in, 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 at such a time. And even historically, I'm a historian as well, uh, that these that African-American soldiers actually had participated in every fight in this nation's history. And so it, to tell those stories, like most people would not even realize that they were black Confederate soldiers. My favorite medium would be pencil, or uh, some people refer to it technically as graphite. Uh, uh, that's my favorite. 
and then it would be watercolor, uh, then oils, um, and color pencil. I'd have a technique with color pencil. It's called painting with pencils. And it is very sh short strokes, layered color, which look more like a painting than they do a drawing. But it's, uh, uh, I've learned various techniques from uh, from being in the illustration business. Uh, for myself, I just always liked to draw, ever since I was a child, just drawing, 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 drawing. And, and I do this every day. Uh, it's probably not a day that doesn't go by that I don't doodle or, or draw something. Frank Walker's fine art can be found on display permanently in downtown Charlottesville. The Shenandoah Caverns has been thrilling visitors of all ages for nearly a century. It's the only Virginia Caverns with elevator service, making it one of the easiest caverns to navigate. A guided tour takes you on a one-mile trek over crushed gravel pathways through 17 rooms of spectacular scenery. The caverns itself these formations that you see behind me, such as the beautiful flowstone, gets its appearance because it looks like it is flowing down over the wall. All of this is formed by the dripping water that you can see falling from the ceiling. The water as it seeps through the ground when it rains outside or when the snow melts, it seeps down through the surface and it collects different types of minerals, mainly calcium in this particular caverns. When the water reaches the cave, the water evaporates, the minerals are left behind to build up the beautiful formations that, that you're looking at right now. One of the interesting things about the caverns, it does take about 120 years to form a cubic inch of these beautiful formations. So when you're coming into the caverns, you almost have to look at it as the aspect of being in a museum. The caverns uh, environment is a very fragile environment, so we ask that visitors to the caverns make sure that you don't touch or handle the formations. One of the things about the caverns that we do stress is protecting our environment and making sure that we keep pollution under control. Here in the Shenandoah Valley alone, we know of over 2,000 caverns. Now, not necessarily as large as the Shenandoah here, but anything that goes onto the surface, whether it be pollutants or anything of that nature, can get into our groundwater. If they end up in the groundwater, they end up damaging the caverns very important to make sure that you don't contaminate the drinking water, which is also the same water that forms these beautiful caverns. Now it's time to strap on your helmet and lace up those skates. We're taking the track with the hard-hitting ladies from Harrisonburg's own Rocktown Rollers. Here's an inside look at the Rock'em Sock'em Sport of Roller Derby. Eve Ferguson and my derby name is Bad Acid. Um, it's always scary trying something new, but I had a little bit of experience skiing, so I kind of understood the skate motion. But I think the biggest draw for me was just being with a big group of strong women and having something to do extracurricular outside of my studies. You know, when I was younger, I really loved skating. I was a rink rat, I was there all the time. And so when I got a little older and had kind of gotten out of it, I came to this rink here at Funky's and the ladies told me that there was a roller derby team in town. I came to the next home bout, fell in love, and I was at the very next practice. Actually for me, the hardest part is truthfully like just the balance of time. I have a family and a young child and a demanding work. So for me, I love roller derby so much, I try to make it work. 
I would say since it is kind of a, a grassroots or underground sport, you notice a lot of even teams outside of Harrisonburg's team, there's just a community that if you went to another city, you'd be invited into another team's family, you'd get to skate with them. Um, our drive is just to improve personally and so it's really competitive but at the same time it's really look at what you can do now and just try and be better yourself. So I really appreciate that. It's just so inspiring to see these women uh, just build each other up and be able to just be in their own element. This is our team, we're family. We see each other twice a week. And, um, I mean, and we know it's practice, like I've gotten hit in the face every now and then and it's not good. <laughs> but I forgive and forget because I know I've accidentally hit people in the face. I've accidentally done bad penalties. Um, it's, it's just one of those uh, family bonds. We, we go through a really rigorous boot camp of screening, if you will, so that we teach people how to fall safely and how to hit safely so that you're making sure the people you play against are safe and you yourself are safe. And so just practicing that on a daily basis gives me enough confidence that I'll, if I do fall, if I do slam into someone, I'm not gonna hit anywhere vital and break any bones. It's, it still could happen. Um, I, yes, I have been injured. Um, I actually tore my ACL a few seasons ago um, and it was a very challenging recovery, but um, everybody stayed in support of me and I was able to, to come here and still participate even though I wasn't physically able to skate. So of course that risk is out there um, and not everybody gets hurt, uh, but I can say from, from my experience, obviously it can happen. I feel like the Rocktown Rollers have a really good relationship with the city of Harrisonburg. Obviously I've only been on this team for a year, but I see we'll go out, people will know us or um, us getting sponsored by Three Notch, the brewery, we have a connection. We volunteer at quite a few different charities. We have found that communities love their roller derby teams. Uh, roller derby is not just about us being out there on the track and hitting each other around. Um, it's really about more than that. It's about supporting the communities that we're in and vice versa, those communities giving back to us as well. It's just wonderful to see all these women just build each other up and just knock them down and be able to pick them right back up, right? So like we hit them, knock them down, and get right back up. Natural Bridge, Virginia is filled with nature's beauty and culture. We recently had the fortune to visit both Natural Bridge and the engaging Monacan Indian Living History Exhibit at Natural Bridge Park. Once owned by Thomas Jefferson, purchased for a mere 20 shillings, Natural Bridge is an ancient wonder carved by erosion and time. Monacan Indians used Natural Bridge as an escape from advancing enemies, sealing the bridge's stay in Monacan lore. Let's take a closer look at these living historical sites. Yes. The Natural Bridge is 215 feet tall, 100 feet wide, and 60 feet long, 90 foot from span to span. The Natural Bridge is a natural creation which is fundamentally based upon erosion and weathering. It's a process that took millions and millions of years. The natural bridge rests upon a karst system. Our karst system uh, relates specifically to underground caverns, fissures, crevices, and underground water. Monacan people have a rich tradition related to the natural bridge. And in their time and place, this was indeed a sacred bridge. And there are many legends associated with the bridge uh, that relate to the Indian people. However, many of these um, legends, we're not too sure whether they're actually Native American or if they were made up 
by the settlers in order to explain away uh, the natural bridge as well. We know that by the time that the first settlers arrived into the region, the Indian people that had once occupied the area were now gone. Natural Bridge is a one-of-a-kind place. It is 1,600 acres of cultural history, ancient cultural history, and incredible biodiversity. It's unusual in Virginia for places to be able to trace their heritage directly back to the original indigenous people. And it's unusual in Virginia for specific places to be able to trace their ownership back to original King's grants. And we can do both of that here at Natural Bridge. Visitors to Natural Bridge have a rare opportunity to engage in a truly authentic representation of Monacan culture. So the indigenous people to this area Perhaps here, as long as 10,000 years ago, were the Monacan people. We are thrilled to be able to share the culture of that early people here on site. The one thing that we're really proud about is that even though we're educating people, we are actually preserving our culture. So here at Natural Bridge, where we do conservation, recreation, and education, at this exhibit, I consider preservation as a part of those other three things. We are preserving our history. We're preserving the way that we survived. History and the beautiful land it was written in is waiting for you here at Natural Bridge Park. Natural Bridge is one of many scenic wonders, and Virginia is filled with natural park space and mountain regions that make Virginia truly spectacular. But a Waynesboro author has concerns when it comes to deforestation. Brian Stout shares his thoughts. I graduated in a School of Forestry at the University of Minnesota back in 1960 and went to work immediately for the U.S. Forest Service Department of Agriculture in northern Michigan on a temporary assignment and just two months later was assigned to a permanent uh, position on the Superior National Forest on the north shore of the Lake Superior in Minnesota. Those early experiences, uh, I was eager of course to new job and, and a new career and opportunity to uh, participate with a very, very well-known leading agency in the management of public lands, forested land. But very early on, I began to question some of the things I was observing that were going on within the science of forestry, and they kind of developed some concerns. One of the first experiences I had while I was still even a temporary employee was on the Ottawa National Forest where I was assigned to a timber marking crew where we were laying out a timber sale to be offered to commercial timber operators on a contract basis and the high bidder would uh, then get the contract and harvest the uh, trees and the timber on this particular site. And as I was laying, we were laying out the sale, I kept noticing remnants of an old timber sale that had taken place back in the 1940s. Uh, I didn't know much about it, but there seemed to be a great deal of waste. There were large yellow birch logs left laying there that over the years had decayed and uh, just question why the utilization wasn't so much better because they were obviously high quality yellow birch logs. And again, the whole motive and goal behind this timber sale was to supply products from the forest, what we could take from the forest, rather than what the forest really needed for health and diversity. And so 
These concerns stayed with me and I spent 34 years with the U.S. Forest Service on numerous assignments, in fact 15 different assignments throughout the United States. After 34 years I decided to retire and um, had more time on my hands and these haunting concerns stayed with me. So I began doing some more research on my own uh, as a private citizen now and reading more about the, the natural world and the importance of the forest lands that uh, are left on this planet. And I felt this need to communicate with people and get this story out to people and decided uh, about five years ago to write a book which is called The Trees of Life, Our Forests in Peril. And uh, the whole intent is to explain the importance, the uniqueness of forests and to begin focusing on what the forests need rather than what we want from the forests. When you look back historically at civilizations that have failed and collapsed in the past, it's invariably been the um, environmental issues that have resulted in the demise of these cultures. And the two most important issues is population expansion and deforestation. We're continuing to deforest the forest covered lands on our planet at the rate of or the equivalent of 20 football fields every single minute. I mean that's hard to believe but that's what is going on today in deforestation. And then the U.S. Census Bureau tells us that we are looking at a population expansion that uh, continues to grow worldwide. As of right today we're at seven and a half billion people on this planet and told that within the next 32 years, by 2050, we will reach 10 billion people. So we've taken it upon ourselves to try to get the word out, spread the word of the importance of making some very, very significant changes in the way we relate to Earth. I'm convinced that the Industrial Revolution has in effect lost our intimate relationship that our forefathers and other cultures have had with Mother Earth. A relationship that all things are connected, that every single creature, every single organism plays a role in the circle of life on this planet. And without that, the chain and the circle of life begins to fall apart. Gypsy Town is a band made up of Shenandoah Valley music scene veterans who create a big sound with minimal instrumentation. From blues to jazz and all points in between, their mix of technology, talent and raw energy give them a sound that's all their own. In this Virginia Sound Showcase, we present Gypsy Town. <laughs> everything from Charlie Daniels to Lady Gaga. Yeah. There's always so, like different, you know, people in the crowd want different music and all of us like different stuff. It's, so. not, it's not the same as, as most other bands. Though. Yeah. We play a lot of obscure stuff, but, but good, really good stuff. The thing I like about it is, is Sometimes one of us will think of a song to play, and it doesn't really matter what genre it is. It could be older blues, or some R&B song, or something, and we'll just learn it and do it. And uh, that's that's a pretty pretty cool element about playing with these two. So it's just whatever song we, we have fun doing it. Yeah, yeah. Ha, ha, ha. 
him. I've been, I've been playing a... around here for like 30 years in, in, uh, in bands, different bands. Oh. I started out as an old southern rocker, you know, like back, back in the Leonard Skinner days. And, uh, but since I've been playing with Cheryl, my horizons have broadened a great, a great deal, a great deal. I'm not sad, I'm not sad enough to sing the blues. But there's always like an element of risk taking mm -hmm. right. that you do if you're playing a live show. Yep. And I think it's kind of a, a double edge, like it can be rewarding and then sometimes, yeah. you know, you take risks and they don't always work out sometimes. Right. So that's kind of the And that the makes downside. the adrenaline flow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you're, it's something spontaneous though with live music yeah. that, that it's better, different at least to time. me, yeah, it's different every time you do it. So it makes it better than, right. you know, than, a, than a, a recorded version where you hear the same thing over and over and over again. Well, that brings us to the close of another show. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time right here on Hey Virginia. I'm Kate Martin. Hey Virginia is sponsored in part by Everance Financial is grateful to serve this community. As a faith-rooted financial services organization, we're dedicated to helping members grow more confident futures with their values in mind, a community that's doing better together. I'm coming home, there's a place where I can come home Where the food is raw, and the people are so warm Hey!